All right, this is lab seven. We're going to be talking about the binomial test. We've got three major sections. First, in the practical section, we'll show you how to do that in R. And we'll also see that we've basically been doing uh, versions of binomial tests already in previous labs. We're going to talk about some conceptual foundations of the binomial model, think about it a little bit more broadly, and then we'll relate the binomial model to the task design of an experiment and we'll show how considering the binomial model can improve the task design such that the task will potentially produce a higher quality of evidence. So from the very beginning here, I want to start off with the idea that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. I start off with a silly example about a wise pigeon. Imagine somebody claimed that this wise pigeon um, knew the answer to every question. And you could uh, simply ask the pigeon a question in the form that could be answered with yes or no, and the pigeon would peck at a word yes or peck at a word no that was maybe nearby. So this would be an extraordinary claim that the pigeon knows the correct answer to all questions. Well, what kind of evidence would be required for you to disprove this claim or for you to believe that, that it was true. And uh, we'll think about this example throughout the lab and it turns out we'll actually use um, kind of a pigeon examples because it turns out that in the real world, pigeons are really good at um, classifying visual patterns. So pigeons can actually answer lots of questions that you might think were difficult for a pigeon. But when it comes to say classifying yeah, different kinds of visual patterns, they're actually pretty good at that kind of stuff. And this is a, a research area where the binomial test is commonly used. So let's go on to the practical example, conducting a binomial test in R. Uh, I note here that we've already conducted binomial tests in previous labs when we discussed coin flipping examples, but we just didn't really describe this as doing a binomial test. So we'll talk about a classification performance example here. And uh, so in a classification situation, a uh, subject could be human or anim animal or non-human anim animal. Or for example, they might be given uh, a two alternative force choice task to discriminate between pictures of say circular shapes or angular shapes. So imagine here that a pigeon is going to be seeing two pictures um, and one picture is circular and one picture is angular. And um, if they peck the one that is a circular shape, they'll get rewarded with a food reward. And let's say the pigeon was given 100 trials, so 100 pairs of things. And sometimes the circular thing is on the right, sometimes it's on the left. And we find at the end of the day the pigeon correctly chose the circular shape on 65% of the trials. Right? So it's very similar to a coin flip situation. On every trial, only one of two things could have happened. Uh, so the pigeon could have been correct or incorrect. In the language of the binomial test, the, pe the pigeon could have ha had a success on each trial or a failure. And so we know that uh, the pigeon made 65 successes out of a total of 100 um, trials. This would be like getting 65 heads out of 100 coin flips. And we might be interested in understanding, well, what's the probability of getting 65 heads or more? And that's the question we can answer with a binomial test. I'll point out now that this is um, not exactly related to the pigeon's behavior in some ways. We have got the pigeon doing this thing here. Uh, it gets 65% correct on the trials. And you know we might be wondering, does the pigeon know something about the difference, uh, say, between circular things and angular things? Or I, I suppose, it, is it possible that you could get 65% correct just by chance. Like let's say the pigeon was basically like a coin and just randomly picking 
the different sides. Uh, could it have done this well just by chance? So we can enter these values into the binome.test function. I've just got an example of it right here. If you want to look at the function, um, I guess you could click it and, oh, that's pretty cool actually. This is on the lab website. It'll take you to the help page for this, or you could do a question mark binome test and it'll pop up in our studio for you. And uh, we've got an option X for the number of successes, an option N for the number of trials. P is the probability of a success. So here we're modeling a 50% situation, 50% uh, probability of success. And for alternative, we could choose uh, two different options, greater, actually, let me just flip over here. Can't remember the other one. It's two-sided less and greater. And we'll be focusing on greater this time. So I entered those things in and pressed return. And basically we get this as the output. So I'll do that in R here real quick. So the output looks like this. When you run that test, it just prints the output to the console. And most of this output is stuff we put into the function. So we see that there's 65 and successes uh, and 100 trials. And the information we're looking for is the p-value right here. This p-value, it's the probability of getting 65 successes or more out of 100. Uh, so it's a pretty low probability, 0 0.001759. I'm going to actually just ignore all of this other stuff. Um, we haven't talked about the logic or possibilities of alternative hypotheses, and we have not talked about confidence intervals yet either. And in many ways, uh, these aspects of a binomial test are potentially, uh, there's this disagreement on what exactly these things mean and whether they should, how they should be calculated. So I'll skip that. Um, yeah, so if, if you were re reporting this, you might simply write a sentence that looked like this. Pigeon A was 65% correct and then in parentheses, p less than 0.05 binomial test. You're just saying that this uh, level of performance has a low chance of occurring according to a binomial test. You might also report an, ex a, an exact um, probability, so less than or equal to 0 0.00. One eight, and uh, I can't remember actually the off the top of my head what the APA rules here are for rounding. Maybe it, it might be rounding to three here. But uh, yeah, that would be something that that'd be a way you could report a binomial test. It's also possible. Uh, so notice here, I just wrote this down. Like I, I looked at the printout, and then I wrote those numbers in here. It's also possible if I flip back to the document here. Um, so in these two cases, I just wrote it's all by hand. And in this case here, uh, these numbers, 65 and this p-value, I had R write those numbers. So what I did there was, first of all, stored the result of the test into a variable. So now it exists in the test results variable. And if we write test results, we can see that we have access to different uh, features of the printout. So statistic is the number 65. Um, you can go through all of them and figure out what they mean. P-value is the P-value. And then um, using this syntax um, right here, so it's like a little bit like a code chunk. It's basically like this. Um, we're saying, I think that's a back tick. 
and the letter R, and then any code we put here will be treated as R code. So this would print out as two because one plus one is two. And so I'm asking it to print out the value 65, which is stored here. And I'm asking it to print out the P value, which is stored here. All right, next up in the lab is examining this report, uh, determining what we can conclude from this binomial test, and considering what this has to do with the pigeon and talking about facts and inferences. I'm gonna leave that to you to read and we will move on to the first concept section, the foundations of the binomial model. Um, the binomial test produces a specific number, right? We put in 65 out of 100 and we got back the probability of getting 65 or more successes out of 100. Uh, we could have put in any, num any number from zero all the way to 100 because those are the di all the different possibilities. The pigeon could have got zero correct or one correct or two correct or three correct all the way up to 100 correct. And so the full binomial model in is the probability of all of those different things happening. And we could plot that using... Uh, ggplot and the d binome function and this is uh, similar to the d norm function that we've looked at before it gives the uh, probability density uh, for each number of success in the binomial model so all i did here was um, had the function return the probability densities for all of the possible outcomes from zero to 100. That's this part. And there's 100 trials, and there's a 0.5 probability of a success. And then I plotted this in ggplot, and we see this right here is the full model. So for example, um, what would happen the, the, the most often would be getting 50 successes. And there's a, basically an 8% chance of that happening. Um, as we get more extreme from 50, so getting a 75 out of 100 is very rare. Getting 90, like basically after around whatever this value is here. So this is 60, so this is 65. You know, things that are in these regions have virtually zero probability of occurring. I like to think of this distribution as a chance window. It shows us uh, what kinds of outcomes could be produced by chance and their likelihood. Um, the area under this curve should sum to one, and we see that it does here. We could just sum up all of those values and they equal one. This is another way we could do the binomial test. So if we wanted to know the probability of getting 65 or more successes, we could simply sum up the probabilities from 65 to 100 as I did here, and we get the same probability that would be returned by binome.test. Okay, so just to make this very same point with a slightly different example, consider the case where you flip a coin 10 times, and let's say you get seven heads out of 10. Uh, we could do a binomial test here to figure out the likelihood of getting seven or more out of 10. And I just changed this formula slightly. We're going seven to 10. There's 10 total trials, but the probability is 0.5. And we see here that the probability of getting seven or more out of 10 is 0.17. And 
and that's the same probability you get if we'd put these values into a binome.test where we would say x is 7, n is 10, and the alternative is greater. The probability of that is 0 0.1719, so this is just rounding uh, this 8 up to a 9. And, of course, the th um, we could have asked all sorts of questions. What's the probability of getting 0 out of 10, or 1 out of 10, or 2, or 3, or 4? And uh, what I did was made a little table here to just illustrate the full binomial model. Um, so there's 0 to 10 total number of heads you could get. Each of these are outcomes has a specific probability associated with it, which I calculated using the D binome function. And then I just made some cumulative uh, columns here. So we're adding up. So this number plus this number equals this number. All of these three equal this one. All right. So if you wanted to know what's the probability of getting two or less heads, you're just going to add up these three probabilities and or look up at this table right here. Um, so what I've done is made a lookup table, basically. If you were commonly dealing with the flipping a coin 10 times situation, then you could just look, look up any of the outcomes and see their various probabilities of this table. And you wouldn't need to run the binome.test function which is just basically accessing parts of this table. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is to show that the binomial model is very closely related to the task design, right? So you could, by task design, basically I'm talking about the number of trials in your task. In the first pigeon example, there was 100 trials. In this coin example, there's 10 trials. Now, the very beginning of this lab, we talked about an extraordinary claim that a pigeon uh, knew all of the answers to all of the questions in the world. That's an extraordinary claim. We would want extraordinary evidence to support that claim. In my opinion, we would want to design a task capable of providing that kind of extraordinary evidence to assess the claim. We wouldn't want to put this pigeon to the test using a design that wasn't up to the task of providing extraordinary evidence. So this is the concept of learning how to design your experiment to allow strong inferences in the first place. For example, um, let's consider uh, an experiment where the number of trials was one. Okay, so if the pigeon um, got one correct answer out of just one time, uh, you know, so you ask it a question and it says yes, and it could have said no, and it turns out yes was the correct answer. So the pigeon its performance is 100% correct out of one, one out of one. Well, would, would that be enough evidence for you? I mean, for me, I would think, well, you could have got one out of one by chance 50% of the time. So it's easily could have been chance. Now let's give it two questions and see if we can get them both right. Let's give it three. Let's give it four. How many should we give it? Well, um, what I've done below is started creating binomial models as a function of the number of trials. So here's a table where the number of trials is one. And there's basically two things that can happen. You get a success or you don't get a success or you do. And so there's only two possible outcomes there. And the probability of either of them happening is 0.5. If you changed your design and had two trials, well, now you can have zero, one, or two successes, and these are the probabilities associated with those. If you have three trials, we have a different binomial model. Uh, now there's four possible outcomes, and he's, these are the probabilities of each of them occurring. 
So of course we could keep doing this and going up to a hundred or a thousand. Um, let's talk about one last thing here to, I hope drive home the point that the length of the experiment here, um, that choice you make to set the design will allow you to make different kinds of inferences about different levels of performance. So for example, consider a value that is very close to 50%, like 51%. So if you had somebody getting 51% on some test or level, or some test of performance, you might say, well, that's not very good. That is very close to chance. Chance could have easily done 51%. Well, that depends on the design. Um, whether, or not, whether or not chance could do 51% depends on the number of trials. So for example, check this out. If there are 100 trials, let's look at the probability of getting 51% or greater. We can use the binome.test function. I put in 51 successes, 100 trials. The probability of getting that uh, 51 or higher is 0.46. So certainly that's highly probable. It could easily happen by chance. What if there's a thousand trials? Well, 51% there would be 510 correct. And now the probability that chance alone would do that or greater is 0.274, so it's getting less likely because we've increased the number of trials. What about 10,000 trials? Well, now uh, 5,100 is 51%, and check it out. The probability of getting 51% chance or greater in this scenario is very low, 0 0.02, all right? So basically, if you use 10,000 trials, which is a very strong design, any time you got a value greater than 51%, you would have reasonably good evidence that chance didn't produce the result. All right, in the next video, I'll go over some ways to solve these generalization assignments.